Okay, so it's a pleasure uh, to have Christian here. Uh, he's the first speaker of session 6B, and he'll tell us about how to implement geometric complexity theory. So, Thank you very much, Rafael, for the introduction. Thank you very much for coming to my talk, Implementing Geometric Complexity Theory on the Separation of Orbit Closures via Symmetries. This is joint work with Umangatan Kandazami. Approving computational lower bounds um, complexity lower bounds is notoriously difficult, not only in the Boolean setting, but also in algebraic complexity theory, right? Where the, where the um, flagship problem is the famous valiance determinant versus permanent problem. And geometric complexity theory was founded by Mumuru Nitsuhuni to solve this and related problems. And the setup is roughly as follows. So you interpret the determinant versus permanent problem as a specific orbit closure containment problem. And then the goal is to use the symmetries of the determinant and the permanent, because they're so differ different types of symmetries, to find now um, irreducible representations that appear more often in the coordinate ring of one of the orbit closures than the other. I will explain uh, a tiny bit in a second or what that means more specifically, um, more precisely. And those things are called multiplicity obstructions. And there was a shortcut proposed uh, in the original papers by Mulumuli and Sehoni that has been um, blocked by recent progress here. But fortunately, so occurrence obstructions, they do not work. But fortunately, there are toy settings where one can prove that indeed you can separate two orbit closures using, occurrence, uh, using multiplicity obstructions, but not using occurrence obstructions. So what we do now in this paper is we exhibit multiplicity of structures in also a toy setting, it's the factorization setting, but this time we purely derive these multiplicity of structures from the symmetries of the two points. So um, in all GCT papers before, there was always only the symmetry group of one point being used and the other point could have been generic. Well, that's not the goal of GCT. You wanna have two points and their symmetries should be the reason why you get a separation. So the um, toy example is a very, is a, very simple example. Say you have x squared plus y squared, then you can write this as a product of two homogeneous linear polynomials here. But you cannot do that if you have more variables uh, in the higher degree, right? You go to three variables in degree three, then you cannot write that as a product of homogeneous linear polynomials. So this is the toy example. This is what we reprove now using GCT and, and uh, the symmetry groups of two polynomials. Um, yeah, for all m greater equal to three, the power sum polynomial does not factor as a product of homogeneous linear polynomials. And we use two symmetry groups for this. And one of the symmetry group, symmetry group is the symmetry group of the power sum polynomial. And one is the symmetry group corresponding to this product. Here is the symmetry group of the product polynomial x1, x2 times up to xm. And we find multiplicity obstruction that prove that. So what, is, what are those multiplicity obstructions? Give you a tiny glimpse of what I mean by this. Of course, the long version has a much better explanation. So you start with the vector space here. This is our ambient space. It's the space of uh, finite dimensional vector space. It's the space of polynomials, homogeneous of degree m in m variables. And inside there, you find a set delta m, which are the polynomials that factor as a product of homogeneous linear polynomials. I call this delta m. And this can be written as this specific orbit closure. Right? Of, you take this polynomial, you take its orbit closure. That's the same set. And the goal is to prove that this power sum does not lie in here. Right? So this is the, this is the goal. And, uh, as a tool, we define a new set. This is a variety. This is also a variety, gamma m, which are just the homogeneous polynomials that have sigma m, lambda m, sigma circuits, or in other words, um, uh, uh, the closure of that. Uh, in other words, uh, they should be in the orbit closure of exactly this other polynomial, which is the power sum poly polynomial. Right? So this is the sum, m, sum of m summons of um, powers raised to the power of m of some sums of things. Right? And now, um, well, why are we studying gamma? Because the power sum lies in delta, if and only if gamma is actually contained as a subvariety in delta. And now for the sake of contradiction, we assume if gamma lies in delta, we want to disprove this. And there's an equi equivariant surjection from the one coordinate ring of delta to the other coordinate ring of gamma. So um, in homogeneous degree d, these are both finite dimensional vector spaces. So they decompose into a direct sum of irreducible representations and we can count the, the num these multiplicities here. This is just how often a specific irreducible occurs, right? So Schuess Lemma says that these multiplicities on the delta side must always be greater or equal to the multiplicities on the gamma side. If this is not the case, we get the separation that we want, okay? And indeed we do get this. A very simple lambda actually gives this. So the theorem is very simple that we prove. It's a toy example. So the lambda is also expected to be simple. It is really simple. So we get uh, this multiplicity for the gamma side is two, the, for the delta side is one. 
uh, and this gives us our desired result. Note here that this is not an occurrence obstruction because this is here, um, if this is a prime plus minus one, this is actually indeed greater than zero. This is also not a, what we call a multiplicity um, a vanishing ideal occurrence obstruction because here there's also leeway. So in both directions, there's leeway. This could be higher numbers. This could be a lower number. This could be a higher number. The proof has two parts and uh, the upper bound is classic, uh, is derived from the symmetries of the one polynomial. The lower bound is new. And uh, so there were no lower bonds known for these uh, multiplicities on, uh, so lower bonds on these multiplicities are difficult to find. And we also derive them in the same, in the very similar fashion as the upper bonds, we derive them from the stabilizer, from the symmetry groups of this other polynomial. Um, and yeah, so ingredients are significantly more complicated than for the upper bound, but, but we, so there's algebraic Peter Weyl theorem, polystability and fundamental invariance. And in particular, we derive a new lower bonds for plethysm coefficients here uh, on the way. And if we want to go into the direction of now separating like serious complexity classes like variance determined versus permanent conjecture, you would have to now replace these polynomials because those are the simple, simplest things that you could think of. So this is just the power sum you want to and the end have something like the permanent polynomial here. And this is the product. You want to have something like iterated matrix multiplication or determinant or things like this, right? And uh, yeah, no known, there are no no-go results in this direction known yet. So. We want to see how far we can go with this. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll clap uh, for everybody. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, we have some questions. So if you can post it on the chat or raise yeah, your hand. Yeah, I cannot see the chat actually. Here. Oh, don't worry. I, I will see the chat and, and ask you. Okay, good. On behalf of everybody. Um, Sorry, so uh, there is one question from the audience. So what is uh, VPS? Oh, VPS is, um, is the polynomial, is polynomial, sequences of polynomials that can be written with, polyno with, with skew circuit circuits, arithmetic skew circuits of size that's polynomially bounded. So you can also think of things that can be written as determinants, so as, as, as projections of determinants of polynomially large size, or you can also think of um, things that can be computed with algebraic branching programs of polynomially bounded size. And those are all equivalent. Those are all equivalent. It, it's roughly, it, it, well, you can think of polynomially bounded size arithmetic circuits, but that's not exactly the same class. So we don't know actually if that's the same class. But you can think of, yeah, determinants is usually what co co commonly what people think of. You want to write your polynomial as a determinant and the entries are affine linear polynomials in your determinant. You want to know what is the size. If that size of, is polynomially bounded, then you are in this class, otherwise you're not. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have another question from Tushant. You can ask yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, what would uh, the next uh, non-trivial example would be like? Uh, which pair of polynomials would you say would be the next step to try to show a separation? Yeah, part? so the next step is, I mean, you want to do modest progress, right? So at the moment, for example, these two polynomials, they have the same number of variables. Next step would be that we don't want to have that, right? So, um, yeah, even yeah, at this point, uh, if you, for example, have a different number of summons here, then that would already be interesting because we need that in the end anyway. So these, the two polynomials should not have the same number of variables. So that's definitely a next um, step that sh should, we should be able to do that. And there's also, yeah, it seems like this is possible. Okay, so one last question, then we'll switch. So uh, Sujit is asking, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, any continuous representation of GLNC is a rational function of the matrix entries and may contain negative powers of the determinant. But if we assume the representation is polynomial, then is a direct sum of sure modules. Is it obvious in this case why the representations of interest are polynomial and not just rational? Yes, because here, see, um, that, yes, because here everything is happening, um, in the coordinate ring of the ambient space, and that's a polynomial representation. So there's the, the action is give, the action that you have is given by polynomials, um, and uh, and this and this this whole representation here is a polynomial representation. So there there are no quotients of anything. Mm -hmm. They just don't appear here. 
Okay, very good. So we can save uh, more questions to Christians for, for after the other session. Um, yeah, anytime. Now let's uh, go to the next speaker. So Pierre, do you want to start setting up? All right, yep. Okay. Uh, okay, now we're ready for the second talk of the, of the session, which is on the program size complexity of sub-assemble paths, and Pierre will give us the talk. Uh, hi, hi, and thanks for attending my talk. So I'm going to talk about the program size complexity of self-assemble paths indeed, which is a joint work with Damien Renew and, and Damien Woods. Uh, this work takes place in the general field of molecular computing, whose goal is to uh, build computers using molecules. So for example, uh, quantum computing folks compute using uh, quantum particles, and we, we try to compute at the slightly larger scale of, um, of molecules. The, the challenges and the models are vastly different. Uh, so this is, on this slide here, you can, you can see uh, an example realization of the field called uh, DNA origami, which are uh, fairly large structures of a few hundred nanometers in, in width. And uh, the bottom two rows show atomic force microscopy images of um, such experimental realizations using DNA and this, 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 is a, this is a result by Paul Rodman in 2006. And uh, one thing I want to mention about the, this particular thing is that uh, these structures are all hard-coded. So what are they doing in a, in a computer science conference? Well, it turns out we can also compute uh, with DNA using a slightly different uh, uh, principle um, based on, on little square tiles that uh, can come together and, and, and stick together. Uh, based on the, like, the, the uh, complementarity of DNA base pairs. So here is uh, another uh, atomic force microscope image by Constantin Evans showing a, a binary counter. So here on the, on the, left, on the left column here, you can see a, a little dot uh, on, the, on the top row indicating one. Then on the next column, there's another little dot that shifted indicating two. Then there's two little dots, that's a three. Um, well, the, the dot in the fourth column is, uh, is, is not, does not appear. It's probably due to some experimental artifacts. Um, all right, so in 2000, uh, Robin and Winfrey introduced the abstract Talis and the model in a stock paper called the, uh, the program size complexity of self-assembled squares, because their goal was to their, their benchmark shape was, was squares. And in this model, you start from a, a seed assembly sigma, which which might be a single tile or might be more tiles, a finite set of square tile types T with an infinite supply of each type and, and a temperature table. I'm not going to uh, talk too much about the temperature in this talk because our results is about the uh, temperature one case, which greatly simplifies the model. So here in the temperature one case, you start from a, a here it's a single tile, it might be more, as long as it's connected, it's good. And you can attach tiles on the, onto the existing assembly based on the color condition. So if the border is of the, uh, the same color as um, it's the tile next to it in the assembly, you can attach the tile. So for example, these, these tiles can be attached, they can be attached to all the time. This one as well. And, and this one uh, can also attach, even if, even if it has a mismatch. Mismatches can occur, it's fine, as long as at least one side matches. And the question is in this model, well, in, in, the, uh, in the more general temperature two model, uh, we could build counters, Turing machines, and all sorts of uh, uh, cool things. So here, can we, uh, can we do the same? Can we build counters? Can we build Turing machines? Well, uh, actually, not, not so much. So but we can build still something. So for example, this is an algorithm by Rothman and Winfrey, building a, an n by n square in two n minus one tile types. So that's uh, less tile types, which is our main complexity measure less style types than hard coding everything. So this algorithm works by first hard coding a single row by, by using uh, n different tie types, and then doing the same for the columns, hard coding every single column. But we can um, reuse the, the tiles for one column for the other, and we can actually reuse the tiles for, uh, like let, let all the, the tiles and the, like, all the columns be the same. So here we've built a five by five square with only nine tie types, which is more efficient than the hard coded n square tie types. And uh, the question is, can we do better than that without pumping? And when I say pumping here, I mean that in, in one dimension, this model is equivalent to finite automata where there's a pumping lemma. So um, here in, in, one, in one dimension, we're, we're sending stuff on the line. And as, see, as soon as we see a repeated occurrence of a tie type, we can repeat the parts of the assembly that's between them infinitely many times, uh, yielding a, an, an infinite periodic assembly, which is no, no good for computation. But the puzzling fact 
and that's a result from 2011 by Pete Fried Fowler, is that in 3D, meaning they've re replaced the little squares by uh, little cubes, uh, in the exact same model with the same conditions, uh, the, the model will start simulating Turing machines. So that's really puzzling. So what's, what, what's about 2D that makes it uh, seemingly hard or, or maybe uh, impossible uh, to compute? So our results this year uh, gives uh, a few elements of answer. But before that, um, one question is that if we, if we are to compute, computation must generate very large assemblies compared to the number of tile types in the tile set and, and actually unbounded, not, not infinite assemblies maybe, but at least uh, assemblies of arbitrary, uh, of arbitrary size because we're simulating Turing machines. So before trying to do that, um, before even trying to simulate Turing machines, so what's the largest non quantum assembly that can be built in this model? So in, in 2015, I showed that uh, you can actually reuse tile types efficiently contrary to what was uh, believed before, including by myself. And I showed that um, for, for all epsilon, you can find a tile set uh, that builds only assemblies of width two minus epsilon times the number of tile types in the tile set. So that's not super huge, but it's still better than uh, uh, the naive thing. And um, we improved this, this bound last year with Daniel Renio uh, to, uh, to T log T. So the question becomes, can we do better than that? How big can we, can we guess? Well, the theorem in, in our paper uh, in, in stock this year is that for all seed assembly sigma and all tiles of T, any assembly alpha of uh, the width given by the, the bound here, uh, T to the T times sigma, like any assembly of at least that width is, is going to be comparable or fragile, fragile meaning that uh, we can build, build another assembly beta before alpha that blocks uh, alpha. So we cannot deterministically build something big. So in conclusion, uh, this is, uh, this is one of the first absolute negative results about the model. And by absolute, I mean that uh, this is not a result up to reductions or, or simulations, unlike some of our pre previous results where we showed that uh, temperature and model, uh, temperature and tile assembly did not simulate, let's say temperature two or other models of tile assembly or uh, even itself. Or So we showed uh, a bunch of results like that. And this is, this is one of the first times where there's a strong absolute limitation on the power of this model. And um, as part of this, as part of this, uh, uh, this proof, we had to develop a powerful tool, what we believe is a powerful tool for tile assembly, we, which we call the shield lemma. And that's a, that's a, a, a mostly topological lemma, uh, quite, quite involved, like the proof's quite, quite involved. But um, I, I don't have time to explain what, it's, what, it, what it is about. And on the, uh, on the downside, our upper bound is still much larger than the uh, best known lower bound of T log T, since we were, were talking about T to the T here. And we conjecture we can do better, uh, like quadratic T square or something like that. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Etienne. I'm just going to uh, clap in for everybody. And uh, there is one question from Scott. Um, could you say again, what's the difference between your model where the best lower bound is T log T and the previous wind-free model for which there is apparently a T squared lower bound? T squared, uh, so the previous T, uh, what's the previous wind-free model? Uh, what is the previous wind-free? Uh, one second, let me, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Let me just, maybe if I unmute Scott, it might be the best he might be able to. Second, Scott. Um, oh, right. The one where we can ma make a 2D square of size n times n using only uh, two n minus one. Yeah. Well, it's the same model. It's just a. It's just that. Uh, so, so that's that's this algorithm, right? So, here um, in in this, so this is this is the same model still working in the. It's in it's still temperature and tile assembly, and um, so so what Winfrey and Rothman proved is that you can you can build. Uh, a large, a large enough square, like a quadratic square, in uh, two, with two n minus one tile types. But if you look at the width of this square, it's um, it's it's a fairly small width in the sense that the width is is n. Or if you look at the Manhattan diameter, it's two n minus one actually. So here, the Manhattan diameter of the square, if you go along the diagonal uh, uh, here, for example, to get the Manhattan diameter. Uh, you get you get actually just nine, which is two n minus one. For a long time, uh, a, con a conjecture in the fields had been that um, any any uh, any assembly you try to make that goes more like to, to that Manhattan diameter more more than 
the number of tie types in the type set is uh, bound to be to be pumpable. But um, but so so here we prove that so this the, that conjecture is false, and that's uh, my my results there. And I see. So uh, I see. I think Scott yeah understood your answer. So he said that you care about width, oh, not right, total yeah, size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no problem. Or, or width, or or Manhattan diameter, or all right, that's the kind of measure. Okay, cool. Or here we're really moving a never bound rather than a, an algorithm or layer bound. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so let's proceed. Okay, I'll thank you again for the nice talk and answering the questions. Uh, now let's uh, set up Will uh, for the next talk. Okay, uh, Pierre, I think you just need to stop the sharing. Great. Right? Thanks. All right, very good, very good. So now we have uh, Will Perkins presenting to us that this is the third uh, talk of our session, presenting about the efficient sampling and counting algorithms for the POTS model on the integer lattice at all temperatures. Okay, uh, thank you. And thank you all for attending this session. Uh, this is joint work with Christian Borgs and Jennifer Chase from Berkeley, Tyler Helmuth from Bristol, and Prasad Tedeli from Georgia Tech. Um, okay, so uh, the topic of uh, our paper is about uh, statistical physics and algorithms and their interplay. Uh, statistical physics is a very old field and uh, it's concerned with modeling matter, gases, fluids, and solids as prob probability distributions over interacting particles or spins. Um, and the, the nice mathematical tool used in this field is uh, a particular type of probability distribution that encodes some complex uh, dependencies in a very simple way, uh, graphically, meaning the interactions are, occur across edges or hyper edges of some uh, graph or hypergraph. Um, now, uh, beyond statistical physics, this type of probability distribution is extremely useful because of this property. And you may have heard of uh, these distributions described as Boltzmann distributions or Markov random fields. Um, now, the, the algorithmic question related to these models is, can you sample from these models efficiently? And because the probability distribution is uh, defined in terms of relative weights, uh, an equivalent form formulation is, can you approximate the normalizing constant that makes this a probability distribution? Uh, and this will depend on the model, the, depend on the graph, and depend on the parameters. And in particular, uh, a physical phenomenon, phase transition, uh, which I'll explain in a couple of slides, actually seems to um, interact uh, in interesting ways with uh, whether or not there are efficient algorithms to do this sampling task. Uh, and the, the question I'm quite interested in is when are phase transitions barriers to efficient algorithms? And we certainly know cases where phase transitions are barriers, but I'll give an example where phase transition is not a barrier. Uh, one thing we'd like to do is to use tools from statistical physics to design new algorithms. Uh, and that's what we do in this paper. And the particular tools are uh, something called pure gov sinai theory, contour models, and the cluster expansion. Previously, these were used to actually prove slow mixing results for Markov chains, but we'll use them to design algorithms. Okay, so the, uh, the model I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is the POTS model. This is a probability distribution on uh, colorings with Q colors of the uh, vertices of a graph. And we choose a, a certain coloring with probability proportional to the exponential of beta times the number of monochromatic edges. Then this function z summing over all the colorings is the partition function, this normalizing constant. And beta is the inverse temperature, one divided by the temperature. Uh, and in the case I'll talk about, beta is positive, meaning that we prefer monochromatic edges. Um, OK, so here's a couple of simulations on the 2D grid. You see when beta is small, this is high temperature. Uh, we see a disordered state, uh, whereas at low temperature with strong interactions, we have one dominant color. Uh, and there has been a phase transition in between. Uh, so it's well known that the POTS model undergoes this phase transition on ZD. Uh, at small beta, we have things like exponential decay of correlations, and we say this is, uh, these configurations are disordered. While at large beta, we have this long range order and uh, a dominant color, uh, typically. 
Now, what are the computational problems precisely? The two main computational problems are uh, to approximate the partition function or to approximately sample from the model. And uh, this whole field actually was a topic of workshop one in stock. So if you're interested, uh, please do watch those videos. There's some interesting talks there. And there are many different approaches to approximate counting and sampling. Uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, the correlation decay method, Barvenox polynomial interpolation method. But all of these methods are somehow limited by phase transitions, or you might have to uh, bypass the phase transition phenomenon. Uh, and so that's what we'll talk about here. Our, our main result is uh, for the POTS model on ZD, uh, if Q is large enough as a function of D, uh, then we give efficient approximate counting and sampling uh, algorithms for the POTS model at all temperatures, uh, subcritical, supercritical, and uh, the critical uh, temperature. Uh, this also works in the more general random cluster model. And in fact, that's how the proofs go via this random cluster model and works for subgraphs of ZD, same. Okay, and uh, just to conclude, I'll give you a, a quick uh, sketch of the idea. So um, pirogov sinai theory, which uh, dates from the 70s, was used in 1991 to actually show that the POTS model exhibits a first order phase transition on ZD. So it's a classic uh, tool in statistical physics. Um, probably the most relevant paper to our work was Borgs, Chase, and Tedeli, three of my co-authors, used a very sophisticated form of pure gov sinai theory to prove optimal slow mixing of the Swenson-Wang Markov chain for the uh, sampling from the POTS model at the critical temperature. And then uh, a year ago, uh, Tyler Helmuth and Hus Rex and I implemented an algorithmic version of pure gov sinai theory to obtain efficient algorithms at very low temperatures. So what we do here, our main contribution is to really obtain a full algorithmic uh, implementation of pure gov sinai theory. And the key difficulty and the key new ingredient here is a method for dealing with something called unstable ground states. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you. OK, so thank you very much. I'll clap for all the speakers. And I guess we already have one question, so right after my clap. So uh, a question from Holden Lee. So what is the obstacle to proving the theorem for small q? Very good question. Uh, and so that, and that's a nice open question. So probabilistically, now there are uh, methods for understanding small q. The method that we use, pure gov sinai theory in the cluster expansion, it, it's a perturbative method. And so you need some parameter to get large and so that some functions decay exponentially fast. Uh, and here in this implementation of pure gov sinai theory, large Q is the perturbative parameter. Um, but it would be very interesting to extend these results using other probabilistic techniques to any Q for which uh, the model exhibits a first order phase transition. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think there's a question uh, from the panelists. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so a very simple question. Uh, what is the motivation for studying, uh, in particular, the torus, ZD? Uh, so the torus, uh, just because um, if you don't put boundary conditions on, then you really see all Q different uh, phases or Q plus one different phases. And so, uh, for instance, this is where Markov chains mix slowly. Whereas if you put on like certain boundary conditions on a, on a subgraph of ZD, uh, you might just force yourself into one of the states. Yeah. Yeah. So, what are, what are example physical systems that could be used to implement uh, this? Um, so, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. So, the POTS model is a toy model of a magnet. Uh, there are other actual physical systems where you can see uh, phase transitions occur. Um, but the algorithms are, are not related to any dynamics of the physical uh, model. Okay, we have one more question from the audience. So Christopher is asking, does starting from the one over Q mix, mixture of uniform starting states and running Glauber dynamics sample correctly? So that's an excellent question. That's a, a conjecture we have in the paper. Uh, we conjecture that this should work if beta is above the critical beta. At the critical beta, this will not work, um, but there should, there, there should be a similar algorithm if you go to the random cluster representation by starting either at the ordered state or the disordered state. So we, we do think that this works, but we have no idea how to prove it. It's a great open question. So 
That's good. We may have space for one more question. Um, Okay, if not, I'll thank you again, Will, and then um, I guess we'll move over to the next speaker and then we can ask questions uh, after the session's over. Okay, uh, now hi, we sir. have, you ready, James? Yep. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so this is joint work with Ian Mertz. Uh, we found a new algorithm for something called the tree evaluation problem. So I'll start by giving a little bit of context so the tree evaluation problem was introduced uh, by a couple of 2010 papers with the goal of separating complexity classes. Uh, the problem's designed so that it's easy to solve in poly time, but it seems to be impossible to solve in log space. And one reason uh, people believed that is that for a period of about 10 years, nobody was able to come up with any improvement to the original algorithm from the 2010 papers. So uh, we found the new, the first new algorithm since 2010. And I just want to mention, it's still not a log space algorithm. So it's still possible TEP might be used to separate L from P. So over the next few minutes, I want to uh, first of all, describe what TEP is and then talk a little bit about our algorithm. So the input to TEP is a complete binary tree with information attached to each node. So each leaf of the tree has a number attached to it and each internal node has a table of numbers. And based on this, we're going to recursively define a number. The values at the leaves are already part of the input, and the value at any internal node depends on the values at its children. So if we look at this node on the left here, its children are three and one. So we look at row three, column one, and we find the number two. And we do the same thing at the other nodes, and we find the number one at the root, and that's the final output of TEP. So this problem has two parameters. There's the height of the tree, which is three in this case, and there's k, which is the range of numbers at the nodes, and k is also three in this case. And what that means is that every number is from one to three, and all the tables are also three by three. So the way this problem structured kind of immediately suggests an algorithm, which is you should start at the leaves and work your way up until you've computed the root value. So we call this the pebbling algorithm. Uh, that name might make sense if you've seen pebbling games. And the pebbling algorithm takes h times log k space because at some point it needs to remember the values of h different nodes at the same time. So what I want to do now, I've got a, a few minutes left, is talk about how our algorithm does better than the pebbling algorithm. So there's a long line of work about how you can compute things with very small amounts of space by using sequences of reversible steps. So I've just listed three papers here, um, an 89 paper by Barrington and a 92 paper by Ben Oren Cleave led up to this 2014 result by Berman et al on catalytic space. Um, and that one might have in fact been partly motivated by uh, work on TEP. So our algorithm is a sequence of reversible instructions. Uh, for example, the first instruction here says add input number one, so multiply input number one by register number two, add the result to register one. And you can take the inverse of that instruction just by changing the plus to a minus. Our algorithm relies on this multiplication lemma, which says that suppose you have d different subroutines which compute, uh, the first subroutine adds some value x1 to register one, and uh, so on, the last one adds some value x sub d to register d, then we can combine these subroutines in order to compute the product x1 through xd, and it takes uh, on the order of two to the power d subroutine calls. Now, I'm sweeping a lot under the rug here, but this uh, two to the d plays a big role in determining the space that our algorithm uses. So how do we use this to compute TEP? So remember, there's a function at each internal node. What we're going to do is turn that function into a polynomial. And we're going to use the multiplication lemma recursively to compute that polynomial. Recursively, because the inputs are also the outputs of the polynomial. Um, and the total space that our algorithm uses depends on how we design this polynomial. So the space our algorithm uses is h times d plus b, where h is the height of the tree, 
D is the degree of that polynomial we designed, and B is the size of the encoding we use for the inputs at various uh, nodes on the, or sorry, for uh, the values we store at each node on the tree. To cut a long story short, um, we found some choice of parameters that makes our algorithm take space h times log of k over h. So to conclude, we found the first algorithm since uh, the original 2010 algorithm that improves on h log k. Um, and there are two directions we're interested in from here. The first is, can we make our algorithm use even less space? Another interesting direction would be to find some kind of lower bound against this entire class of algorithm. So for example, maybe a lower bound could tell us we've pushed this technique as far as it can go, so we need to keep looking if we want to make the space smaller. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, James. Um, okay. Now we open up for questions. Um, so I have a question. So in the so in the in the TP problem, like so, why why using a catalytic algorithm um, like is important? Like is relevant towards the conjecture of p and log spaces because catalytic you you get the because in catalytic you get the extra space for free, right? That you can. Yeah. So the algorithm we designed, it's not actually a catalytic space algorithm, but it's kind of inspired by that work. Um, really, the techniques we use, you could also probably find a lot of them just in the earlier papers before it got to the catalytic space work. Um, the reason catalytic space caught our attention is that it kind of blocked an approach we were using to try to get a lower bound. They, they kind of pointed out that an argument we're gonna, we were trying to make basically isn't going to work. So we just tried, I decided, we decided to um, take advantage of that to design a new algorithm. Okay, so it's inspired on catalytic type algorithms, but uh, but not really using them, I see. Um, okay, so there's another question here, Paido. Uh, so what is the next step uh, for you guys? So what are the immediate challenges? Um, so yeah, there, there are a few different directions. Um, so one question is, um, so, so there, there are a lot of things we could try to do. If, if we could find um, an improvement to this multiplication lemma, um, actually, I think as stated the, uh, on the slide, it is possible to get a um, smaller number of subroutine calls for this lemma, but due to the details of how we use it, it doesn't actually quite work out. So basically finding some way to improve this multiplication result or generally finding just new methods to use re reversible computation to maybe squeeze the space down even more. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, we don't really have much of an idea of how to get corresponding lower bounds. I, I should mention um, there were some lower bounds on restricted classes of algorithms, which kind of showed that this um, pebbling algorithm is optimal. Um, but of course, uh, our new algorithm breaks that. So, you know, uh, our new algorithm isn't in that restricted class that the lower bound was for. So it'd be interesting to extend the lower bounds more. Thank you. Uh, Christian, yeah, you can unmute yourself. Um, do you have a, a, do you know of a replacement for TEP where your uh, methods would not work? Um, well, like one thing to keep, one thing to keep in mind is we haven't actually pushed it down to log space. Uh, so it might just be that no replacement is necessary. Uh, First, we need a replacement for the lower bound arguments we were using before. Uh, we've been trying to push our space even lower. It feels like maybe we're running into some obstacles. So, so the first answer is um, maybe TEP is still a good thing to work with. Um, yeah, besides that, um, I, I don't have any obvious candidates in mind, but I've been kind of narrowly focused on TEP. So that's probably why. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so Janos, Janos had a, a, a question, so let, let me see, he raised his hand. Janos, uh, can you unmute yourself and, and ask the question? I, want, I, I was just curious, what was the, the uh, lower bound idea that the catalytic algorithms shut down? 
Uh, sure. So the kind of lower bound we were trying to compute, we were trying to prove is the following. So we wanted to argue that in order to compute the value at the root, you should first compute the value at, say, the left node. And then you should hold that value of the left node in memory while you compute the value of the other node. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of steps to this argument, but one step in particular was we wanted to argue that holding that value in memory from the left node while you compute the value on the right node, kind of, it, we wanted to argue that's additive, that you kind of need to reserve some memory just to store that because you're never going to compute it again. You can't lose it. Um, and the catalytic space paper basically says, if you have some spare memory lying around, but you um, are responsible for restoring it to its original value once your computation is finished, they actually showed that you can take advantage of that extra memory, even though you have to. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Undo all of your changes. So that's what broke our attempted lower. Okay, great. So, um, thanks. Yeah, so Christian, if you look at the chat, there's also um, another comment from Ian. Um, so he's saying that one potential problem would be that the circuit value problem, besides it being P complete and thus being a natural candidate for separating L from P, our approach works because the height is always logarithmic in the input length. And in catalytic computing, you usually end up paying a two to the H cost, which would be exponential for a general polydeath circuit. So that's the answer for everybody. Thanks, Ian. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna conclude the session here. So thank you, I would like to thank all the speakers again and I'll thank for everybody. And uh, now maybe we can uh, perhaps stop recording and uh, whoever wants to talk and ask questions, the speakers can do so.